This is the house where I grew up, in Rose Bay, a relatively well-off suburb of Sydney. My family sold this place long ago, but it still holds many memories for me. spent in here in this house would have been 1964 it's 35 years 36 years everything looks in a general kind of way the same and yet nothing looks the same it's the most common experience of people I suppose who go back to their childhood houses but I've never really felt it before for a start the place is so much smaller it used to it used to be huge now it's not tiny, but it's a house. I used to think of it as a sort of castle when I was a little boy. It's changed. Taste is much the same. And Georgian genteel taste. Yeah, my mother would have liked this room. Middle class covers a huge spectrum, of course, and we were socially somewhere near the top of that spectrum. I mean, we were about as far up in the middle class as you could be, I think I can say without boasting, in a country that doesn't have a hereditary aristocracy. But to tell you the truth, we never thought very much about that. Australia did not feel as though it had a strong class system, but in fact it had one. You see, this is one of the great illusions that Australians like to spin for themselves. We like to think that we're, if not classless, at least pretty close to it. But in point of fact, Australians have always had a very strong sense of where the top dog in the room is. Not in a servile way, not in that sort of way which you see in England where people are constantly sniffing around the backside of power to find out who to lick, but rather just so that you can know who's where and who's what. That sensitivity to class goes back to the colony's earliest days. My family came out from Roscommon in Ireland in the 1830s. The primal Hughes, John, was a grocer, and he would have thrashed anybody who'd suggested that he'd ever worn the king's iron. Blood with the convict stain was a disgrace. But today, many Australians search their family trees in the hope of finding a genuine horse thief. That early division between sterling and currency, the descendants of the bond and the free, was crucial, and it's left its marks everywhere, giving us a collective uncertainty about class. It made us rely too much on the idea of luck. The top dog was at the top because he was lucky and not because he was cleverer than most. You picked a beardy. I'm at the races to meet an old friend, our former Prime Minister, Bob Hawke. When I was Prime Minister, well, people often used to ask me, how do I get to know, get to know Australia and Australians? I always said, go to the races. You see them all, the multi-millionaires, the paupers, the saints, the sinners. I, I think it's a, it's a good uh, way of, uh, for someone who doesn't know Australia to get the feel of that, I think, fairly unique ethos we've got in this country of the fair go. Getting a fair go is one of the key Australian social ideas. It means getting an equal chance, not being handicapped by someone else's privilege. The people that came out here, the convicts and the free settlers, they, they really came out to Australia determined that the constraints and class barriers and divisions of the old country were not going to be here. I mean, they were about creating something different. This is a consoling myth, but it's a myth. 
The free settlers weren't interested in making a classless society, not a bit. They wanted the convicts to be a permanent underclass and they loaded them with social disadvantages. The fact is that when you come to the races, you really see a reasonably classless community. I mean, united all of them in the pursuit of an honest, always honest, dollar. Yeah, naturally honest. Naturally, naturally an honest dollar. And uh, where you know, Jack's as good as his master in action. Would you believe that I've never been to a racetrack in my life? I always thought you were the well-rounded man, and, and no bloke from Australia can be really well-rounded if they haven't been to a race course. So oh. I will tell you on this dark, sodden, soggy day, a sophisticated way of losing your money. And if I win, I'll cut you in, though. I know you're not supposed to say that to a politician. No, but no, no, no. No commissions, mate. No commissions. Uh. <laughs> There never has been a classless society, and there never will be. What we do have, though, is suburbs. The ideal suburb isn't egalitarian, it's fraternal. It makes room for class difference, but doesn't parade it. It wants to pretend that everyone has equal access to the good life. A potent myth, but also a myth. So welcome to Sanctuary Lakes. The name even sounds like the title of a soap opera. Sanctuary Lakes. Let your imagination fly. Imagine a stupendous, luxurious lifestyle being sculpted from this rugged, busy construction site. Maybe a little hard to imagine right now, but as they say, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. And Sanctuary Lakes is like the finest omelette, created by the greatest chef who ever lived. And these are the men who broke the eggs to make the omelette. Uh, my name's Peter Rigetti. My name's Stephen Head. And we, we run, run Sanctuary Lakes. Peter? I tell them it's special, it's different, it's like nothing else in, in Victoria. It's a, it's a resort community, it's a village, it's going back to community. Well, it's like suburbs of the past mainly because it's like a, a type of an enclave where uh, there is only a single entry in and people uh, are encouraged to participate in all the facilities within the project itself. By the time Sanctuary Lakes is completed, it will be home to 7,000 people, or so the developers hope. But for its first family, moving took a leap of faith, an investment in the idea of a better life. We're Jerry and Helen Stevens. And uh, we were the first family to start building here at Sanctuary Lakes. Most of our friends thought we were crazy. They really, so for probably six to 12 months after we bought and, and started building here, we kept having to justify it to people, kept having to sort of say, look, you know, it's gonna be this, it's gonna be that. And now they've just all, they're all envious. Helen Stevens is a nurse and her husband, Jerry, who grew up in England, is a foreman in the petrochemical industry. They'd call themselves ordinary people. They want a good life, but they're not status crazy. Their desires are modest. Now we tend have to contend with people saying, you must be really rich, you know, you must be rich. Carly said, one of her friends at school said, oh, it's okay for you, Carly, you're rich, but um, we're not, you know, you don't have to be. We are uh, just normal yeah. people with a big mortgage. They're living in a place that seems more planned, more like a gated community in America than the normal Australian suburb of my youth but maybe just as open to imagination. Jerry, for instance, has a scheme. I'm in the middle of um, making a private beach so we can have a nice uh, palm tree in the corner here 
and uh, yeah, the kids can relax and play on the beach, and they've got the pool to jump in as well at the same time. I believe um, what I've achieved out here in this time, or well, even 15 years out here, uh, I've never would have achieved in England in a lifetime. The lifestyle here is very sort of more middle class compared to England. It's just a fantastic lifestyle. Love it. much of an emphasis in a things but class doesn't seem to make much of an impact on a lot of things usually I find in Australia you've got a chance to do most things the suburbs tend to level expressions of class difference but out in the country, it used to be very different. Colonial life aspired to a clear English hierarchy. This is the mansion Werribee Park in Victoria. It was built by the Churnside family, whose fortune was made in wool. It took them only three years, from 1874 to 1877, to raise this immense pile the grandest surviving house in Australia. In its day, it was a symbol of wealth, ostentation and power, the power of sheep. The top Australian families were so reliant on sheep for their wealth that they were known as pure merinos. I don't know what I expected to see when I came to Werribee, but um, it wasn't what I got. Werribee is a fine version of a colonial fantasy of an Anglo-Scottish stately home. You can almost smell the tweeds and the wet dogs there in the Australian sunlight. The billiard room at Werribee is a wonderful fiction. The owner of the place obviously had been abroad and he was determined to replicate the same effect here. So along he went to Sotheby's, I guess, and he bought a job lot of those extraordinarily lugubrious highland paintings of shaggy wet cattle and mists on crags and then he got himself a really fine billiard table from Melbourne and he ornamented the whole thing with the stuffed heads of a variety of animals from several continents including a hippopotamus. It's most unlikely actually that Mr Chernside shot any of these creatures himself the only living organism that he is known for sure to have shot and killed was himself, a feat that he achieved with his own hunting gun in the laundry here at Werribee in 1887. He did not miss. We will return to Australia beyond the fatal shore. This sense of Australia as a transplanted Briton survived well into the 1950s when I was a kid and my mother was still talking about a place 14,000 miles away that she called home. The landed families mimicked everything English from dance steps to interior design. In the 1920s, the country had bachelor and spinster balls. These are said to have survived, but in what shape? Cody and the preacher on their way to a bachelor and spinster ball. Cody is a stockman and the preacher is a wood turner. Plan is to get on the run, get drunk, talk to your mates, and hopefully get a, a route by the end of the night. Yeah. <laughs> it's 4 pm and the build up to the ball is not a polite affair. Instead, it's what's known as circle work. You'd think this fuel-injected 4x4 invasion would have the locals up in arms, but many country towns have hit rock bottom, and it's only events like this which help them survive.
think the BNS is very important to rural towns. Yeah, the country yeah. towns. They're dying. They're yeah, they're dying. dying. Um, you sort of uh, you put a um, figure on it. Just say you got 400 people showing up to a BNS, and the average person will uh, spend a hundred dollars. They were originally for upper class people meeting other <laughs> upper class people like singles, and then they'd marry money into money. Uh, it's changed a bit since then. A BNS ball is now a much more down and dirty affair, but a little of the sense of decorum remains. A BNS now is just a term of having a good time. It's gone like a little bit more sort of feral, you could say, right? More relaxed. Feral. <laughs> it's gone bloody feral. <laughs> If you were to name one place in Australia that you'd expect to sneer down its collective nose at such yob culture, it would have to be Melbourne, the traditional home of Australia's establishments. I had a date for the evening here, Lady Susan Renouf. Susan, I am, as you know, a Sydney boy. The only version of Melbourne that I have is the Sydney version, which is Melbourne is a stuck-up, uptight, Anglophile, uh, establishment-ridden city compared to lovely, relaxed, free, open Sydney. Now, uh, it smells a bit like a caricature to me, but does it have an element of truth? I think it does, yes. Uh, in what way? I mean, first of all, does Melbourne really have an establishment in the English sense? Yes, it does. More so than Sydney. More so? More so than Sydney. How more so? More hereditary or what? Uh, hereditary, I think um, the establishment came out and uh, tended the land. They weren't convicts and they, they were settlers. Well, Sydney began as a penal colony, didn't it, really? So they tell me, yeah. Yes. The, uh, we didn't. <laughs> no, and you're disproportionately proud of this, aren't you? Well, you are proud of it. Well, there is a lot of um, rivalry, I think, between the two cities. One of the things that every American thinks he knows about Australia is that it's a classless society. And, of course, I think that's balderdash. Yes, do I do. Yes, definitely. It, it's got a very strong strata. sense of class. Very strong sense of class. There's nothing wrong with class. We're going to the opera tonight. Are we going to see the fabled Melbourne establishment there in the audience? I think they'll be there. I think they'll in be... In force? Ah, yes. It's yeah. opening night and it's a grand occasion. Caesar, a story of rise and fall, the battle for power, the struggle for dominance. Not a bad choice of opera in Melbourne. Here in Melbourne, the power of new money is always eclipsing the old. But that's the way establishments do renew themselves, and always have. Such an English scene. Croquet in the rain. But 
But don't let this image of old money fool you. The host Jeannie Pratt is new rich and proud of it. I've always thought I'd rather be nouveau rich than nouveau poor. I personally feel that the establishment keeps changing. I think people are not as snobbish, perhaps, as they used to be. I think at one stage, people used to say, uh, what is your family? And then they said, how much money do you have? And of course, nowadays, I think people say, what do you do? Our company's been going for 50 years. We make paper and packaging. And in fact, one of the things we do is we recycle half the waste of New York City. Jeannie Pratt lives in a stately home known as Raheen, with her husband, the third wealthiest man in Australia. I've lived here for about five years. I've actually lived in Melbourne for about 40 years. I started out in Sydney as a journalist, and uh, now I guess you'd say I'm a bridesmaid dancing at too many weddings. The Pratts have spent vast amounts bringing in craftsmen from Europe to return Raheen to its former glory. And they let the place be used for fundraising. This is rare in Australia, which has never had a tradition of cultural philanthropy. It's a job, actually. It took me 14 years to restore. I guess it hasn't been an idle indulgence because we've raised over $100 million here for various worthy causes. But Raheen is part old and part very modern. Like Melbourne itself, it straddles past and present. When you walk from one wing to another, it's as though you're entering the late 20th century. Richard and I didn't want to live in a museum, so I thought the automatic extension to a 19th century building should be a conservatory. Our architect, Glenn Merkett, won the Alvar Alter Award a couple of years ago, so we get a lot of architects coming to look at the new part and a lot of historians coming to look at the old. The Pratts may look like oldish money, but they're new. In this, they're true to their town. Melbourne itself looks like old money, but it was once the get-rich-quick capital of Australia. An hour and a half's drive from Melbourne are the goldfields of Ballarat, home in 1851 to a series of lucky strikes which transformed the country's economy. By the time mining stopped, almost 70 years later, $280 million worth of the precious mineral had been wrung from the earth. And here at this historically accurate theme park, half a million tourists a year relive, for a few hours only, gold fever. Gold! 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 The gold that came out of the clay of Bendigo and Ballarat still had, metaphorically speaking, quite a lot of dirt sticking to it. It needed purification, it needed transcendence. And this is where it got it. This is the exchange room of the English, Scottish and Australian Bank in Collins Street, Melbourne, started in 1888, and the greatest temple to mammon that has ever been built in Australia or probably in the Southern Hemisphere. This is where the Victorian faith in the essential holiness of money really received its architectural form. Gold implanted our belief in luck as our saviour, workers' luck. A lucky strike could abolish class distinctions. The triumphant digger cried, we be the aristocracy now and the aristocracy be we. Still today, Australians are obsessive gamblers. We blow more money per person on gambling than any other nation on this earth. 
We'll bet on almost anything. We lose and lose, but we never feel like suckers. Black and white case. How do you do it? Bill? Bill Bill? Hey, how you yeah. Bill? Okay. Yeah, I reckon we ought to have a panella on this race. Okay. Uh, box panella, one, two, and three. Would... All right, let's give it a go. Okay, there we are. Give him the money. Well, you better tell me what to, how much I should bet on that. Oh, I'm just saying it's five dollars. Just give him the money. Yeah, that's good. Tell me something. Why, in your judgment, have Australians always had such an obsession with luck? and with gambling. I think it's got something to do with the, the tough physical environment. When our first European people came here in 1788, it was not the most congenial circumstances, no, as you well know. <laughs> and the odds were against them in many ways. And I think it was a question of, well, we're going to you know, set ourselves against the odds. And so the question of sort of gambling against nature almost was part of the early way of life. They were so reliant on one another. Mm. They were so removed from formalised services, the concept of dependency on, on one another and mateship has become a, you know, a very important part of the Australian way of life. <laughs> Australians, more generally, they want a, a good life. Yeah. Uh, and they know that if they're going to have what they, what they see as a good life, then they've, they've got to earn a reasonable quid. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's the, the sort of urge to become millionaire, multi-millionaire amongst Australians that I think you would find as part of the American ethos. And so the blokes that do make the, the multi-multis, they say, oh, well, you know, he's, he's done well, but they don't worship him. We will return to Australia beyond the fatal shore. Right, well, I'm a truck driver, and my name's Lindsay Fox. I think mateship is a very important element in Australia. Being remote, and they had to create this mateship, and they had to care and share and look after one another in tough times. I think it's been handed down from generation to generation, and I hope we never lose it. people are the same. You don't need a, a profit and loss statement or a ledger to relate to who your friends are. Your friends are your friends. Oh, I love driving trucks. Once you're in a truck and on a highway, you're king of your own domain. Just turn up the music and away you go. Lindsay Fox has no need to be driving this truck. It's how he relaxes. He has built up a huge trucking empire both at home and abroad, and he's worth more than $200 million. I'm just a simple truck driver. Other people might complicate the issue, but I don't think I've ever changed at heart. Fox's heart may not have changed, but his home certainly has. Not too many simple truckies own a mansion in the Silvertail Melbourne suburb of Turak. I think in Australia you can still start from nothing, amass a certain amount of wealth and um, do whatever you want to do. I don't think it applies anywhere else in, in the world. In Australia, uh, I, I guess predominantly, we don't have a class structure. We have people that relate to people. But the kind of people Lindsay Fox relates to are hardly ordinary. His two best mates are Bill Kelty, head of Australia's union movement, and Solomon Liu, a billionaire entrepreneur. Nobody's superior, nobody's inferior. The fellows I went to school with currently collect the garbage from here, but if they want to come in and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, or the local cop's going by and he wants to call in and have a cup of coffee, he's most welcome. A cynic could argue that it's always easy for the wealthy to dismiss the significance of class. But many Australians, including me, do strongly believe our country has a basically democratic spirit, more than most others. 
even if we mightn't go as far as Lindsay Fox. Australia's unique. You know, Australia's the best kept secret in the world. Uh, when the English sent us out here 200 years ago, they never realised who was being punished. Because this is the land of plenty. Australia has far richer citizens than it did when I was a kid. It also has not just poorer ones, but a real underclass. The society is polarised, now more than ever. This new grinding poverty marks places like Campbelltown at the edge of Sydney's western suburbs. But today, residents of Proctor Way in Campbelltown are here to celebrate the unveiling of a phone box. A small event, but for people here it's a lifeline. Brian Murnane is the area's housing officer. The last public telephone box that was here um, only survived uh, five or six days and uh, someone tied a rope around it and actually literally towed it away. A new phone box, or nearly new, the crime rate in Campbelltown is so high that the authorities would only give them a second-hand phone. Public telephone here in this suburb is essential because there is a high rate of unemployment and a lot of people just cannot afford to have a telephone. So if someone has a sick child or an emergency, they have got nowhere to go. Four out of ten people in Proctor Way are Pacific Islanders. For the unveiling of the phone box, they're organising a traditional Islander meal, or umu, for the whole community. Migrants often find it hard to get work, but here the high proportion of Samoans is no accident. Their physical prowess and their reputation for toughness made them very useful to the authorities who wanted to turn Proctor Way around. In a street of 26 houses, we had five drug houses and uh, a brothel to try and get control of. And uh, so what I did is I uh, moved uh, a large Samoan family, and I don't mean numerically large, I mean physically large, in next door to the drug addicts. And uh, within a very short time, the drug addicts had gone. They were afraid of the Samoans. Gradually, the number of islanders at Proctor Way increased, and in 1996, Mac, who was a tribal chief in Samoa, started a regular nighttime patrol of the estate. We are peaceful people, or we keep the peace, and we want to work together with other uh, communities uh, and other nationalities uh, from other countries, so we can all do things together while we are living here. We used to go around and we found a lot of uh, troublemakers and that's why that we give them a word of good advice to keep out of trouble otherwise we'll get in touch with the police. It's changed. Even around the park here alleyways very safe now. Even at night time, now you can see the recall the new street lights, even the park here. At night time, it's beautiful. We are so proud. We are so proud. There is a real community at Proctor Way now. It has a two-year waiting list for potential residents. There used to be 60 police incidents a month. There have been none in the last year. But this is a small example. Walk a few blocks and you'll find neighbouring estates with huge problems. And Proctor Way still has an unemployment rate of 50%, seven times the national average. Places like it represent one side of what happened to Australia in the 1980s. To see the other, you have to cross thousands of miles of outback to where we run out of Australia and hit the Indian Ocean.
This is the city of Perth and it is flat. Millions of acres, everyone as flat as its neighbour. It's not a landscape to get the blood of a romantic poet boiling, but it certainly has a romantic effect upon real estate developers. And during the 1980s, it became the centre of one of the biggest real estate booms in Australian history. The boom transformed Perth and the nation as a whole. I'd come back in the 80s and realised that people were making really serious money. And in Perth, if you made a fast buck, you bought property here on the Swan River. Hello everybody and welcome aboard the James Sterling for our Captain Cook cruise and another beautiful day here in Perth. Although Perth is the most isolated capital city in the world, they reckon that there are more millionaires per capita living here than anywhere else in the world and doing this tour down the Swan River, I, I believe it. By gee, there's some money along the river. Holy shamooly, we're talking some big money. Well, I couldn't afford to live on millionaires, right? And it's a bit of a statement of the heady days of the 1980s. Nothing was uh, too expensive. You know, the funny thing is listening to Western Australians talk about the tremendous luxury of the harbour foreshores and the houses on them in Perth. Um, I was expecting something much more ostentatious than this. I mean, I thought it was going to be rather like going to Miami, visiting your friend Gustavo Rodriguez, dealer in exotic white powders and owner of uh, very sparky real estate. But actually, $10 million doesn't really buy you anything that is not basically rather suburban. It's as though you took ordinary suburban houses and you stuck a bicycle pump in the back door and inflated them 50%, not much more. $700 million. Rolls off the tongue pretty easily, but that's a lot of money, isn't it? $700 million personal wealth. What would that be like? You could only wonder, couldn't you? Australians used not to adore wealth for its own sake or even respect it very much. This changed with the appearance of the prototypical Croesus of 80s Australia, Alan Bond. He was a poor English immigrant who made a vast fortune in Perth. There, people still say he put Perth on the map, which is fine if you feel you're not on the map. He didn't do this with his deals in real estate and media, some of which were disastrous. He did it by backing Australia too, the boat that won the chief crowd of international yachting, the 1983 America's Cup. This was the first time in 132 years that anyone had taken it off the eggs. This is the boat that's kept the cup in place for 132 years. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for this magnificent bolt. Bond latched onto the tradition which dictates that just about the only heroes Australia really embraces are sporting figures. A recent poll showed we ranked its importance only just behind the assassination of JFK. And the Prime Minister of the time seemed pretty convinced of it too. What did you say on the road? Uh, oh, television? well, uh, well uh, that's on the, on the morning after because everyone had stayed up all night. Yeah. Because it was American time and we had to stay up through the night. <laughs> and I said... I tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up the day is a bum. <laughs> Australians fell for Bond's matiness, his non-elitist style. It enabled him to con them all the more effectively. What intrigued me about that style in the 1980s was that Bond seemed to have cultural ambitions and he had some real feelings about art. Especially, he felt he wanted to buy it. And in 1989, he set his sights on a large and very good Van Gogh, Irises. It's the depth of the, the colors themselves. And if you look at the, how alive it is, each, each flower, actually stands out. Bond's desire was quite unsullied by philanthropy. Collecting was unambiguously a form of boasting. Sotheby's didn't need to lure Bond or tickle his fancy. The great white shark of Perth was already over the transom, gnawing ravenously on the gas tank. Well, it's not just a painting. It's, it's the most important painting in the world. 
You still sometimes read that Bond paid 54 million US dollars for irises, a world record. Alas, he didn't pay a cent. To the vast embarrassment of Sotheby's, he turned out not to have the money. This dramatized the collapse of Bond's business fortunes at the end of the 80s. Soon, inquisitive reporters were on Bond's trail. Oh, Barry, from Four Corners. Remember me? You do remember me. Can I ask you how the, uh, how the case is going? Uh, you keep right away from me. You do remember me, then? You keep right away from me. Barry. I'm offering the you judge, an interview on judge Four Corners. Case. Bond went to jail. The law found he had committed a complex billion-dollar fraud and become the biggest thief in the history of a country which had, after all, been founded by thieves. He was released recently after serving 1,298 days in prison. It works out at approximately one day's incarceration per million dollars to punish him. You know, people still profess a certain kind of nostalgia for Bond. I don't. I think he was a completely unregenerate, lousy scumbag of the worst order. We will return to Oscar. The young, brash Oxford graduate must have caused some amusement when he first joined the News Limited board. Newspaper men aren't soft, and young Rupert certainly didn't look very hard with his round face and socialist ideals. I think the important thing is that there'd be plenty of newspapers with plenty of different people controlling them so that there's a variety of viewpoint and that there's a choice for the public. This happy valley of egalitarian ownership was not to be. Eric Beecher recently launched a magazine called The Eye to provide an alternative to the opinions of the Packer Murdoch media. Well, the power of the, of the Murdochs and the Packers, the, the two families that dominate Australian media in Australia, um, is of a much greater degree than in other uh, English-speaking democracies. The media proprietors wield far more power and exert far more influence politically. When I look at situations involving politicians and media owners, I always see the subservient one is the politician, the powerful one is the media owner. As a journalist, I felt that that wasn't why I went into journalism. At last, an Australian fortnightly magazine with vision, insight and a distinctive point of view. The eye doesn't lie. It can't. The dead don't. It is no longer published. It survived for less than a year. That's what happens to independent upstarts in the arena of Australian publishing. I think there's a, a clear awareness among thinking people in Australia that they don't have access to everything that's going on and that strings are pulled by a very small number of extremely powerful people in the spheres of business and politics and they make decisions that affect the rest of us but we don't know anything about them. This is a very real problem, and in my trade, as a writer, a very large one. Freedom of opinion only arises from competition. It only becomes real when there are real alternatives. After so long away, I realise that the situation with Australians and class hasn't changed all that much. We congratulate ourselves on being anti-elitist, but it's a hollow boast. Where it really matters most to their imaginations, Australians are as elitist as anyone else, that is, in sport. But most of the time, anti-elitism slides off into a resentful distrust of professionals, experts, and worst of all, intellectuals, a group for which most Australians can hardly conceal their dislike. We deride politicians, but we can't say who else ought to be doing politics for us. On the subject of achievement, we're schizophrenic. Are we going to get this sorted out anytime soon? Don't hold your breath. This is the meritocracy that dare not speak its name.